All right. So. So yeah, I don't think this dude needs an introduction, really, does he? Yeah, not really. I mean, the man's got a PhD in quantum <laughs> physics. You know, and he's a true wizard of technological innovation and music production, which I really believe has helped to democratize music production for more and more people. So it's not just a rich man's game anymore. And he's uh, contributed to that. I think it's very, very uh, cool to, um, you know, pay homage to that. Uh, so if you want to learn from one of the best, then you've definitely come to the right place. So, dearest boomers, it's an absolute honor for us, isn't it? It's an honor. It is. And, and just, just to mention how special this is, uh, this is our presenter's 10-year boom anniversary. Yeah, right. And major Woo! things happened 10 years ago. He's going to tell you all about it. Yeah. And he, also, uh, he and his wife Carrie are my favorite couple in Boom. They're awesome. He just had a great talk about volcanoes and the birth of the elemental forces backstage. Yeah, because they were in Hawaii, weren't they? <sighs> Shit's going down. <laughs> yes, Hawaii. Yeah, and he, he had his first boom in 2008, and yeah. that changed a lot of things, so, so we're going to leave that part to him to so explain to you. So we're coming full circle. We are indeed. Give it up for a lot of love and appreciation for... Steve Young, otherwise known as the Maverick, that is Head Plus! Woo! <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, for the wonderful introduction and uh, for the opportunity to come and talk at this uh, amazing event that just gets, goes from strength to strength um, every year. Um, I was originally built to be doing a talk with my partner in audio alchemy, Andy Friest, but he unfortunately couldn't make it, so uh, the kind of interactive music part we were going to do is not happening. I'm just going to be giving a presentation about audio alchemy, which is what I've been working on for the last three years. Um, and it's really a fusion of everything that I'm passionate about and everything I've been kind of studying and researching over the years. So um, <clears throat> I'll start by telling you a bit about myself and my kind of quick biography. Um, I feel like if you're getting ideas from people, it's good to know a bit about their lives so you understand where they're coming from, because it's often just a reflection of our own perspective on life. So <clears throat> quick biography. So I was born in 1978 in Scotland. Uh, I started DJing and learning computer music in 1990, about the age of 12. <coughs> and then after high school, I went and studied a master's degree in theoretical physics at the University of St. Andrews. I started out studying astrophysics and then moved into a kind of quantum physics uh, specialty coming out of there. Um, and uh, <coughs> in, uh, from 2000 to 2004, I did a PhD in quantum physics at the University of Surrey. Um, and you know, during this time, my <coughs> Yeah, I did want to be a teacher and a lecturer at university, but I, I kind of started to lose the love a bit <laughs> during the PhD, which is quite common. If anyone's done a PhD, you'll understand. Uh, it's pretty grueling. <clears throat> but uh, the music was constant. I was playing parties, you know, DJing uh, and practicing music production in you know, my spare time throughout this whole period. Um, <clears throat> in 2004, I created Head Flux. Um, it was actually, I think, created maybe a year earlier as like a, a, a screen name on an internet forum or something, and then I started to use it as a DJ name, and uh, started uh, playing out as Headflux. Um, in 2005, after about a, half a year of unemployment, I uh, got a job as a consultant in the IT sector, which I hated, but uh, I uh, kept it going anyway for five years. And uh, <laughs> in 2008, I had my first boom festival. Um, which inspired me to quit my job in uh, 2010. So, uh, 2008, I also released my first record, which uh, was called Music Is My Weapon. And uh, I actually heard it played at Boom by a friend of mine, Dom Smart, who might be here. There he is. Hey, Dom. Far too loud back in the day. Yeah, played, played my first track here at Boom in 2008. And I. I was there and I was like, right, I'm going to play a boom in 2012. You know, I, 2010 wasn't believable, you know, but 2012, I was like, four years? Yeah, I can do this. And so um, I was inspired to quit my job and focus full time on, on head flux. And uh, in 2012, I played Boom Festival. And it was. <laughs> it, was <laughs> it was the set of my life. Uh, it was uh, beautiful. I'd never had so many people that I, I knew in a crowd that I'd played for before from all over the world, it was super emotional, so I'm really pleased to be back here again. <clears throat> okay, so in 2013, 
uh, after so five years of making quite kind of up-paced, like trance-inspired music with breakbeats, I started to slow down a bit. I started to enjoy the slower tempos and the space that opens up um, at these slower tempos, or at least this Wonderlust EP. But it was also the name Wonderlust was chosen to signify my just lust for wanting to go out in the world and uh, explore. So it was kind of an in intention to leave the UK and just follow the music where it, it, it's going to take me. Um, and in 2015, I left the UK for Central America. So I, I went out and toured there. Actually, in 2014, I met a shaman in Honduras who I had some ayahuasca with and connected with really deeply. And I decided I wanted to go out to Central America for six months and study plant medicines with him. So um, I did that in uh, 2015 and September. And then in 2016, I went to Hawaii to do a show and a workshop called Audio Alchemy. Um, but then decided to stay there because it was awesome and uh, there was really good people. So um, All Your Alchemy was born in 2016 and, uh, and I released the Soul Science album uh, later that year, which was you know, my first attempt at applying some of these alchemical ideas in music production. <clears throat> and then in 2018, I returned to Scotland uh, just a month ago and I'm gonna be basing myself there for the long term because I've been on kind of a, I've been moving around a lot for the last 18 years and uh, uh, I've got three kids now, I'm just like really keen to just like park and build a studio and uh, not have to move around anymore. Uh, so I'm also, I have a beautiful wife I've been with for 25 years and uh, three kids. <laughs> and that was our, our last sunset in Hawaii. <clears throat> so why audio alchemy? Well. <clears throat> These twin threads of science and music have been going through my whole life, and uh, I was always really passionate about both uh, mathematics, music, and physics, and things like this. But um, when I started to have my first psychedelic experiences, which was about in my mid 20s, uh, if, you, if you have any of you trained as a scientist and then had a psychedelic experience, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's just like nothing you've been taught can explain what's happening to you, right? So it's kind of like science suddenly just from going back this thing that you thought was like explained everything, it suddenly becomes this just like little kind of like thought in your mind. It's like this, this whole other reality, this whole other possibilities through uh, plant medicines and shamanism that science just doesn't really even talk about or, you know, certainly not in the last century. Um, so I was kind of confused for a lot of years I was deeply interested in psychedelics, but at the same time, I, I was interested in them because they blew apart everything that I'd been taught, you know? Um, but I'm like, where, well, what is the science of these things, you know? They've been around for so long, there must be some knowledge. Uh, and so that's what led me to alchemy, um, because when I started studying alchemy, not only did it just join all the dots of everything I'd studied my whole life, but, you know, it really brought together these spiritual, out-of-body, psychedelic experiences and the more kind of real, you know, scientific uh, work of the material world, <clears throat> kind of just tied it all together in a really beautiful way. And uh, so, <clears throat> Audio Alchemy was born. So I'm going to talk a bit about alchemy and the history of alchemy, uh, with a view to explaining how it applies to music, how it can really benefit you as a musician or an artist or just whatever you do. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of life, it's a way of transformation, personal transformation and growth. So it's often called the great work, or the art, and it provides a symbolic system of knowledge for the transmutation of energy, both for the outer world of elements and materials, and the inner world of the spirit and the soul. Okay, so this is where it differs from modern science, because modern science has a, a series of symbols to describe the, the world of, you know, the outer world of elements and materials, but it does not acknowledge any inner world of the spirit and the soul and certainly doesn't have a system for working with the spirit and the soul. So, alchemy is the esoteric root origin of modern science, art, and religion, a practical system for personal growth and transformation that connects the dots between disparate fields of scientific knowledge and spirituality. So, needless to say, I was quite stoked when uh, I started researching this. <clears throat> it's considered esoteric or occult, um, and it was stamped out and discredited in the Middle Ages. And it's now commonly and incorrectly thought to be a misguided magical pursuit to turn impure metals into gold for wealth and glory. That's usually what people think about alchemy or what, you know, that's what I was taught at school. 
by alchemy, but actually this is this is just the exoteric, okay? So there's the exoteric, which is what, how things appear on the surface, and then there's the esoteric, which is the hidden symbolic meaning. <coughs> Paracelsus, who was one of the last great alchemists of the Middle Ages, um, wrote a number of books, and it's definitely good to read his work, but he said, alchemy is the art that separates what is useful from what is not by transforming it into its ultimate matter and essence. He said, take it not amiss that the alchemy I teach yields neither gold nor silver, but look upon it as the key which opens the arcana of medicine to you. So, <clears throat> on the surface it appears like it's this quest for gold and, and wealth and riches, but when you start digging deep it's about medicine. So here's this connection now with the music culture, where we're all um, taking these various plant medicines and being shown these things which we're then taking into reality through our art and so on. And I start to see how this is alchemy and we just... We, <laughs> We're doing it, we don't realize we're doing alchemy because we never got taught about alchemy at, at school, you know? But when you start looking into it, it's like, wow, music production, we're transforming sounds. We got all these like, you know, filters and things. And you have these like chemists, which are using, they have all their like filters and separators and you know, all these modules where they're like processing chemicals. And what we have in the studios now is very similar, but we're working with the frequencies themselves rather than these uh, elements and so on. Uh, now this is an old painting. I want to just point out, it's a, kind of a nasty painting, it's, it's called The Alchemist, it was in 1661. And uh, this is actually, on, on the surface it just looks like, you know, a guy in his basement, you know, just, you know, uh, puffing a fire or whatever. But this is really a warning to people who try to do alchemy for vain and glory, because they were called puffers. And, and these were the, the so-called alchemists who just wanted to make gold. Right, you know, and they would puff the fire hotter and hotter, you know, just like burning these metals, like trying to convert them into gold. And meanwhile, his wife and children are sitting there, you know, he's got his back to his wife and kids, they're just sitting in squalor. Um, there's no harmony or geometry in his laboratory at all. The whole thing's completely gone to shit. So, this is a warning, and it's just as relevant to a musician or an artist who, uh, you know, we, we, we want to hear music from people who are doing it for the love, right? Not for the money. And it's the same in alchemy. There are people who do it for the money and the fame, and they would bring disrepute to the whole art. But the people who were doing it for personal growth and for the benefit of all, um, they were kind of like, you know, uh, buried, I guess. You know, that was kind of the information was just like blocked out because it's powerful knowledge. But um, it used to be that it was just in libraries and, you know, uh, dusty shelves in libraries and so on. But now there's like this whole revival of the knowledge. It's just coming up on the internet, all the, these books and everything are getting digitized. And so you can really dive into alchemy and it's an incredibly deep subject that will... It's an intellectual feast, honestly. It's so, it's so inspiring. So, <clears throat> instead of uh, that old uh, lab, we, we imagine maybe the alchemist lab's a bit more like this, you know? Um, where uh, we're transforming metals and, and minerals and uh, trying to make like essences and elixirs and medicines. And so al alchemy is a scientific practice concerned with the transformation of materials. It's based on a different set of principles and assumptions to modern materialist science. It doesn't really fly in the face of science, you know, it's not woo-woo, it's like scientific results are scientific results. Um, but alchemy is, is based on a different set of assumptions about the universe and how it works than modern science is. And I'll talk a bit about those uh, now. So, we see here we got, this is BT's studio, you know. It's, uh, you know, you can imagine how things have evolved over the years and into this. And in a way, like music production gives you the, the cleanest possible environment to practice alchemy because you're not spilling things and blowing yourself up and all that. Well, at least you shouldn't be. <laughs> so, some of the tenets of alchemy then. Um, are these different beliefs that uh, were, uh, the alchemy is based upon. So, the first one is that all things are alive, from the micro to the macro. Death is just a transition, you know, like a drop, yeah? Um, it's not the end. The universe is a living creative system on every level. So this is an ayahuasca-inspired art, and I always see if you look up ayahuasca art, it's always just gleaming with life, because, you know, we either, even just a little bit of DMT in your system, it just, you see that indwelling light that's in everything around you, and uh, particularly, particularly in the jungle at night or something. Um, science, of course, tells us that we're just material bodies and we only live once. Um, consciousness is an illusion generated by the brain. So, yeah, that's the difference there. So, 
Another one is that there exists an invisible realm of cause, which informs and precedes the visible realm of effect. Okay, so you see here he's kind of looking out behind the stars, and there's this other realm which is causing the visible world to happen. Um, and uh, it's kind of, you can think of it like a computer game. Um, you know, the, when you're playing a computer game, you're just playing the effects of the code. Yeah, so the code is the hidden causal reality, and the graphics are the effects of the code. <coughs> and alchemy is deeply tied with astrology. In fact, alchemy and astrology are really the two oldest sciences in the world. Uh, and they believe that the stars and planets each produce a unique quality of light, which is instrumental to the functioning of, of life on Earth, and which manifests in our lives in a multitude of ways. Okay, so again, this differs from modern science because modern science essentially says the planets don't do really anything to us. The moon, you know, the sun gives us heat and warmth, uh, sorry, light and warmth, and the moon controls the tides and has something weird to do with women's uh, moon cycle that <laughs> no one quite understands. But, uh, you know, they say that the other planets don't really affect us, you know, they just don't, they're too far away or whatever. But uh, in alchemy, it was like, no, each of the planets are instrumental in what's happening on Earth. So, another thing is that the external world of nature is a reflection of the internal world of man. So the dramas that play out in the human realm in our lives correspond to the energetic relationships of the stars and planets. <clears throat> I love this quote, this is from the Mahabharata, great alchemy quote, every existent object dissolves into that from which it came. Okay, this, this, with this quote alone you can understand so much, like when you start applying this to your observations, uh, in your own studies, it's uh, really a beautifully succinct quote about how things work. Uh, and so there's this idea, of course, that then there's one ultimate substance. You know, it's just one ultimate substance from which everything came. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll talk about that again in a bit. So alchemy, Terence McKenna, our old friend. Uh, alchemy is really the secret tradition of the redemption of spirit from matter. So this is again telling us that like matter has spiritual potential within it, and alchemy is the art of bringing out those spiritual essences from the materials that you're working with. I mean, you can imagine this like with our bodies, for example, you know, our body is this like material thing, but our words give expression to a, a spiritual, you know, a spiritual being. So when we, we talk, we're kind of redeeming that indwelling spirit through the material. And so this is about like getting essences out of like the earth, um, or out of your music equipment, or whatever it is, you know, your guitar has this potential for music. But, you know, the actual art of transforming the guitar into a song is an al a form of alchemy. <coughs> so, where did it come from? Well, there's really three figures in history that, um, that all this knowledge kind of points back to. Um, we have Thoth in the Egyptian tradition, uh, um, who is uh, considered the god of... Uh, science and culture, you know, he's supposedly brought mathematics and uh, writing, hieroglyphics, uh, music, um, uh, magic, you know, astrology, all these, uh, all these great sciences and arts that we have are credited to Thoth. But in the Greek tradition, <coughs> a lot of the same works and the same things are credited to this figure, Hermes Trismegistus. Um, and uh, there's a whole tradition uh, called Hermetics, um, which is the writings of Hermes, which absolutely encourage you to read it. There's anything that just, it's just truth, just pure truth coming at you, like high level truth, like the hermetic texts are amazing. And so in the Roman tradition it was Mercury, well Mercury, which we now associate with the planet and the, uh, and the metal, which are both very important in alchemy as well. These are basically all the same entity. So different cultures, we have different names for the same gods, um, essentially. So. <laughs> a little bit about Hermes, so they called him Trismegistus thrice great, it means thrice great because he was the greatest philosopher and the greatest priest and the greatest king, having integrated the three principles, body, spirit and soul. So again, this is another part of alchemy, is that everything has body, spirit and soul, everything. Um, modern science tells us it's just the body. <clears throat> so. Hermes wrote seven axioms, which are just like basic truths about how the universe works. And the reason I'm showing you these, and the reason they're relevant to musicians, is because they speak to a musical universe, okay? A, a universe which, in which music is fundamental. And in a materialistic universe, music is an anomaly. 
Yeah, I understand. Like, you know, they, they thought music was just like a mating ritual. You know, we're just like, you know, banging drums just to like attract mates and things because they view us as these animals um, in, the, in, in, the, in the modern science. But it wasn't this way at all. So I'll, I'll show you the, the principles here. So the first principle, the all is mind. All creation is mental, okay? So this idea that all things are connected, all is one, you know, we're all familiar with that. We're saying that the nature of the oneness is mind, okay? So if you've ever had a, like a heavy psychedelic trip, and I suspect there may be a few of you, uh, <laughs> then you, you probably had that realization at some point that you can't really know if anything is happening outside of your mind, okay? You can't really prove it, you can't really know for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, and this is because, you know, uh, the all is mind. And, and, you know, this wasn't just these ancient philosophers like the modern quantum physicists, who I will quote shortly, came up against this problem again and again. They realized there can only be one mind. Okay, so the second principle is correspondence. As above, so below. As below, so above. Or as within, so without. Uh, as, as without, so within. It's this idea that the boundary between our inner world and our outer world is a mirror. Okay, so what we're feeling, what's going on internally, is a reflection of what's happening around us, but also what's happening in the skies is a reflection of what's happening on Earth. Um, and this is really powerful uh, when you start to apply this. So the rest, a bit more obvious, I think. Vibration, okay, nothing rests. Everything moves, everything vibrates, okay? The universe is a vibration, vibrational system. Polarity, everything is dual. Everything has polarity, okay? So up, down, left, right, you know, all the rest of it. You know, everything has these dual poles. And music is very much about the interplay of polarity. You know, you, you find, you know, the limits that you go between and then you just go, you know, up, down, back, forth. You know, it's just, it's polarity, just playing the polarities constantly. Rhythm. All things rise and fall like the tides. Rhythm compensates. So it's this idea that rhythm is the great kind of compensator as we, if you, when you push something out, it's like it comes back, you know, there's a compensation, you know, everything is like, every action is a reaction, produces a rhythm. <clears throat> Causality, okay, every effect has its cause, and every cause has its effect. And then finally, gender. Masculine and feminine principles manifest on all planes. So, these seven principles, together, when I find them, they come from a book called The Kabbalion, which is an e-book you can read, I highly recommend it. Um, these to me speak to a musical universe. Um, and uh, so, for me, I was just like, well, yeah, there's like, all is vibration, you know? Um, if all is vibration, then music is like the, it's like the, almost like the driving force, like everything is musical, you know, everything works on cycles and times, the music of the spheres, you know, um, all of it. But I, I, I never quite saw just how complete that picture was until I started looking into this uh, hermetic stuff. So, so Erwin Schrodinger, who was uh, famous for Schrodinger's cat paradox, he was a quantum physicist that I studied, um, and he said the total number of minds in the universe is one. You know, he came up against that. Same with Max Planck of uh, Planck's constant or the Planck length. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. And then Werner Heisenberg said, the first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will leave you an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass you find God waiting for you. <laughs> Which is a similar thing, you know. It does, science can turn you into an atheist, but you know, if you just keep pulling that thread, you know, um, eventually you're, you're going to reach some different conclusions, I think. So, this is what uh, Hermes uh, says in the Emerald Tablets. That which is above corresponds to that which is below, and that which is below corresponds to that which is above. With this knowledge alone, one can work miracles. Okay, with that knowledge alone. This is a picture taken by my wife just to demonstrate that. It's actually upside down. Uh, it's my daughter walking along there. You've probably seen this quote a million times on your newsfeed. I know I have, but uh, it's one worth mentioning again and again. If you wish to understand the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, okay? Not protons, neutrons, and electrons, no. not matter energy, frequency, and vibration, okay? Tesla didn't even believe in electrons. Well, he, he knew they were real, but he saw them as pulsing, very fast pulsing waves that are localized, 
rather than a little hard ball of matter. And this is a very key difference in, in worldview, because if everything is made up of little hard balls of matter, it's, uh, yeah, well, we, we end up in the predicament that we are now. Um, uh, so, yeah, Tesla said, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all previous centuries of its existence. So I feel like in some way we, as, as this kind of psychedelic community, we are the ones studying the non-physical phenomena. Science is slowly catching up. You know, you've probably seen a lot of progress in, uh, you know, psychedelic medicines and, and their kind of legitimacy as an actual, like, medical practice. Um, it's, it's happening, you know, leaps and bounds now, you know, but it's because of the work that people like us have done, just throwing ourselves in the fire, finding out what these plant medicines do, and then coming back and talking about it, honestly. <clears throat> Walter Russell, the universe exists solely of waves of motion. There exists nothing other than vibration. Okay, so he drew this to show the different bands of vibration, and how they manifest. So at the lowest frequencies, we have solids, which obviously things appear solid. They're kind of stuck. We can't penetrate them. And we go up in frequency, we get to sound, um, which uh, uh, then above sound, we get into like electrical vibrations. Above that, we get into heat vibrations. And then beyond that, we get into the light spectrum the X-ray spectrum, and then your etheric, astral, mental, spiritual. Um, so again, science, modern science only goes up as far as X-ray and gamma ray, and then these other ones are not recognized, but they are higher frequency uh, bands of perception. So, <clears throat> the seven steps of transformation. So this is a big part that inspired uh, how to actually apply alchemy to music. And, and, and to our lives. Um, this is an old uh, painting again from about the 1600s or so, and it shows this kind of like these like seven steps uh, going up towards this uh, sort of scene of like the there's like this union of the masculine and the feminine in there and so on, which is a very key part of, of this progression is like the unif unif unification of masculine and feminine. Um, and uh, I'll talk a bit more about each of these seven steps. So. Okay, so the seven steps in alchemical transformation happen non-linearly and they enable the growth of consciousness in all directions. They are related to the seven chakras and the seven planets uh, as well and are part of an anciently recognized process of permanent transformation that actually gave birth to modern science. Okay, and that's Manly P. Hall, an amazing scholar. Now you're probably thinking seven planets? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, they're talking about the seven luminaries, which are the seven luminous planets, okay, the, the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, and uh, Saturn. And uh, I don't have time to go into all that now, but this is, it all relates, this number seven, okay, it's called the septenary, this idea of the septenary. The septenary is like the kind of holy sevenness that manifests in a multitude of ways, so like the seven colors of the rainbow, the seven notes in the musical scale, seven chakras, seven planets, uh, seven holes in the head, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, the seven uh, miles of the river Nile, like all this, yeah, there's all these sevens like occur, the seven wonders of the world, the seven, you know, it all relates back to the seven luminous planets. So this is called the Azoth, and uh, it's an, an ancient painting that, uh, well not ancient, but uh, yeah, probably about 500 years, I think, um, and it shows seven spokes. Um, to illustrate these seven steps. So starting down here, this is actually the symbol for Saturn, this is the first step. Moving around, this is the symbol for Jupiter, uh, second, third, there's Mars there. The Sun, this is the symbol for the Sun, the ring with the, uh, the dot in the middle. And then Venus, the fifth step, uh, the sixth is Mercury, and then the seventh uh, is the Moon there. And these little figures, they show kind of different, um, uh, uh, like, they explain the kind of process that are happening, but I'll, I'll, I'm not going to talk through this whole thing. I'll show you some other features to note, though. So you see that the whole thing is a triangle, and there's an alchemist's uh, face in the middle. The idea is that you look into his eyes uh, to meditate on the on the painting to receive the kind of esoteric knowledge. You see here we've got um, anima, you've got the sun, uh, spiritus, you've got the moon, and corpus. You have this kind of cube. This is uh, the body, the spirit, and the soul, the three, three levels we were talking about. We have uh, uh, the masculine over here, feminine over here, and we have the four elements. Uh, we got the water. Um, so he's holding a feather in one hand, which is a symbol of air. Um, candle, fire in the other hand. 
Um, he's got one of his feet in the water and that one other one in the earth. The four elements are a central part of all this. Um, and uh, yeah, there's uh, a lot of artworks like this that are you know very cryptic, but once you start to like learn the language and you know start to notice these things, they all start to make a lot more sense. So about the seven steps then. So in chemical terms, they're called calcination, dissolution, separation, conjunction, fermentation, distillation, and coagulation. And calcination, the first step, is really a heating, a roasting process, okay? So um, basically it's purification by fire. So whatever your starting material is, the idea is that you subject it to heat in order to decompose it and re remove any impurities and reduce it to its, its basic essence, okay? That's like the starting point. It's like heating or roasting. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other like terms for it. But it's a, it's a process of fire. And it's a preparation process, okay? It's like you've got to do this before you kind of start doing your transformations. You know, if you were going to, if you were to transform this into, uh, I don't know, a bottle, um, you know, you'd have to start by like kind of breaking it down and removing all the different materials, you know, separating all the materials, getting the plastics out and everything, and then getting the ones you want and bringing them back together to make the bottle. Okay, so that's really what the calcination stage is about. So once you've gotten rid of all those impurities through the, the application of fire, is then the next stage is water, okay? It's dissolution. So you then dissolve your stuff in water and stir it, dissolve it, okay? It's a flowing stage. It's like mix, mixing it up in water um, and things dissolve. And then once it's dissolved, you can get to the third stage, which is separation. And separation is uh, pr pretty clear. Um, that's just uh, sifting and filtering, separating that which you want from that which you, you don't want. Um, the fourth stage is conjunction. So once you've uh, performed your separation and you're like, okay, I want this stuff and I don't want that stuff, you then take the stuff you want and you combine it together, unify it, okay, that's conjunction. So you're taking all your best bits and joining them together, okay, that's the conjunction. And then once that's there, that's sometimes called the lesser stone. It's like you've got something, it's like, you know, it's good, but it's not quite there. And uh, the next stage is fermentation, which is kind of a death and rebirth process. It's like, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with fermentation, like for things like kombucha and wine and stuff. Um, it's uh, a way of, or in, in the case of sauerkraut, right? So you've got like a cabbage, which, you know, it's just a cabbage, right? But if you shred it up with some salt and put it in a jar and leave it for three weeks, it is infused, it goes through this death process and then it's infused with probiotics and new life. And that one cabbage can now be like a whole jar of sauerkraut that could last you months or weeks and it's got so much more life and nutrition in it than it did when it was just a humble cabbage before. And that's the power of fermentation, you know? It's like kombucha. It's like my favorite drink ever. It's just the ultimate drink. It's just tea and fruit and sugar. Um, if you just put tea, tea and sugar together, I mean, it's okay, but... You know, you ferment it and it's uh, absolutely amazing, you know. Um, it, was, it, it kind of kills the original thing and then brings it back to life uh, with this new, new energy. And then so the sixth stage is distillation, which is this refinement and exaltation, okay. So distillation works by heating something, uh, vaporizing it, and then it kind of like goes up through these like tubes like an alembic. And then it condenses on the top and cools down and then they bring it out and they, they can run things on distills for, you know, uh, stills for like months and months sometimes, just like every time the atoms rise up and come back down, the, it gets purified and exalted. Um, and we had a lady at our retreat actually who was a, an artisan distiller, you know, she wasn't even a musician, she came uh, to our retreat to be around us and distill the energy of the retreat uh, into these uh, essences. Pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, so it's kind of an exaltation and then coagulation. The final step is the kind of solidification and realization of, uh, of the thing that you're trying to produce. <clears throat> so when I first learned about these, of course, being a musician, I'm just looking at it and thinking, that's just how I, I make music, you know, there's the seven steps of making music. So <clears throat> in music then, calcination is what I call calibration or preparation, okay? So you have to calibrate your instruments. Uh, I mean, in an electronic music setting, You've got all these plugins, you know, you've got like 40 billion VST plugins, you know, and all this like computing power and everything like that. But before you can actually like get into a flow and make some music, you have to reduce it down to a more limited set of possibilities that you're going to use and kind of push away 
of the stuff you're not going to use. Um, and that's the, ca that's the calibration process. So for me in my own music, that, that would be a case of building a template. So I'd make like a couple of different bass patches, um, some drum kits, uh, you know, um, some like pads, uh, some lead sounds, and uh, yeah, just kind of build a template, uh, some, some like effect sounds, and then I would kind of then stick to those, okay? So uh, I, mean, I might pull in something else later or whatever, but the idea is to like really just limit yourself at the beginning because we know like creativity comes from within limitations. If you have like all the possibilities in the world, like, you don't do shit, you know? Like um, you have to like break it down, set yourself some limits, you know the kinds of instruments you're gonna work with. You have to tune the instruments. You have to, um, you know, set the grid that you're gonna work within, the musical grid, the tempo, all this kind of stuff. This is all calcination, it's like preparation. And the better you prepare, the better you calibrate your instruments and your template, then when it comes to the next stage, which is flowing, jamming, and playing, you get so much more cool music uh, coming out of it. So um, if you're just, uh, you know, just playing with synths as you go, which is how I used to make music, I just pull one in and then dabble around and make a sign and put that sign like there, and then pull in another one and make another sign and put that sign there, and then pull it. <laughs> and it was just so inefficient. Like after years of working like that, I'm like, come on, there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, so yeah, you make your template. And then you can just flow, okay? Or if, if you're playing instruments, you obviously tune your instrument. You can't, do, you can't play good music if you don't tune your instrument, you don't calibrate it, okay? So it's, there's a, a kind of tension and release process out of some music, the more free you can be, you know? You don't have to think about stuff, you don't have to drag in plugins and you know, do all kinds of stuff like that. So, so that's the second, dissolution, it's, it's flow. And also what we see is that <clears throat> things come up from the subconscious during this flow, okay? So, when you're jamming with other musicians, you know, what's great is just all the stuff that just happens, you know, that just, uh, that just flows out of you that you didn't pre-plan or didn't anticipate. Um, and again, calibrating your projects well will allow for a much higher uh, rate of these things to come through, these unexpected musical surprises to come through from your subconscious. And so, once you've been jamming for a while, you've got some beats, you've got some uh, bass lines and some sounds and the kind of, you know, a bunch of ideas together, there's then a separation process which happens, okay? So you probably, everything that you made is probably not gonna be gold, as it were, so um, you gotta kinda sift through and say, all right, I'm gonna put these aside, and these are the ones I'm gonna keep that are gonna be like, you know, key parts of, of the track that I'm gonna make. And then conjunction then is the composition and arrangement, okay? So this is the bringing together of the saved elements from separation uh, into a uh, composition. And uh, so at this point, <clears throat> Uh, anyone here use Ableton? Yeah, quite a few Ableton users. Yeah, so for these first three steps, I'm, I'm in the session view, okay? So I'm just capturing ideas, you know? I'm just like, you know, making scenes. Um, and then I, I move, at this point, I'll then move into the arrange view and then uh, actually layer a composition. So another way of saying that is that, that until, until the composition stage, you just have loops, you know? It's just, uh, and loops are just infinite, you know? They don't have, uh, uh, you know, they're not bounded in time, yeah? So. And often this is where people get stuck, because they'll make a, a loop and they'll like it, but every time it gets to the end of the loop, it just goes right back to the star again, and then they go right out again and again, and then they hate it, you know? And they're like, what do I do with this, you know, how do I make this into a song? You know, so that's, that's a, a, big, a big step there. But when you do, when you get to that composition, you then, it's then bounded in time, okay? So it's like got a beginning and an end. It's X amount of minutes long, and then, then your work is to just go through it, you know, beginning to end, over and over and over, just like making it better. And this is the fermentation, okay? So it's very much a death, death and rebirth process at this point. So often I'll, I'll, I'll be really excited about all the parts I've created, and I'll go into the arrangement and I'll make my composition. And then once you listen to that a few times, you're like, yeah, it's actually really weak, you know? Because at, at that point, I've not been done any transitions, I haven't done any like fiddly editing effects and stuff. You know, it's all just been like jamming stuff that's just flowing out from playing, uh, with you know minim minimal editing and effects. So this is where I get my effects out and my EQs and start like cop you know rendering things to audio, you know reversing things and tweaking them out and you know making the transitions and it's it's a death and rebirth because it's like at that point, you know you you probably at this point you were thinking it was really great, and then after a while you're like oh it's still so much work to do. And for me, actually, this is probably 80% of my, of my process. I actually get to arrangements really quick now because I've got lots of you know, patches and signs and templates and things that I've made. I can just jam out ideas and get a good song idea together pretty quick. 
But then taking that to the next level is the fermentation. And uh, often it'll just die there. <laughs> Instead of actually dying and being reborn, it'll just die. You know, and uh, those are the abandoned projects. But uh, apparently Mercury retrograde is a good time to go back on your abandoned projects, by the way. Um, so I've heard. So, once you're then, your fermentation is complete and you've uh, really tricked out the track and got it all really slick and added all, brought this new life into it, it's then distillation, which is the mix down and the polishing, okay? You're exalting the track now. So, with the mix down, <coughs> Uh, at this point, you know, you might have done, you might have been mixing as you go, but you should definitely do a mix down at the end, you know, once everything's in place. Just take all the levels down and uh, start to bring them in one by one from the, the lowest to, to the highest frequencies. You know, starting with the bass or the drums, getting those sitting together right and making sure that the waves all line up and that nothing's clicking and there's no little overlaps. You know, there's a whole lengthy process. Uh, some people, again, could take weeks and weeks to mix things down. I've got an album in the pipeline that's just been, uh, <laughs> I've been, yeah, just mixing down for a ridiculous amount of time, but uh, uh, yeah, you know, some things are harder to mix than others, but um, yeah, that's really the distillation process, so it's this kind of agitation and sublimation, you know, you're turning things up and turning them down, or like boosting the highs and taking the highs down, you know, you bring things up, you're finding where is the sweet spot of every sound, you know, is it just like, you know, up and down, up and down, until you just like hone in on exactly how it's, uh, how it's supposed to be. And then the coagulation, well that's probably the easiest step, it's just the rendering, it's just actually like taking it out of uh, the, the, the project uh, and into a, a file, into an actual like thing that can be held and shared uh, by others. And of course the mastering process is a big part of that as well. So um, yeah, so <clears throat> looking through this again, I mean there's, there's so much behind all this as you'll start to realize because there's all these correspondences with uh, all the, you know, each of the seven steps, they all have different correspondences, you know. Calcination yeah, corresponds with Saturn, um, dissolution with Jupiter, separation with Mars, conjunction, uh, Venus, I believe, fermentation as uh, the moon, distillation, Mercury, and coagulation as the sun. And uh, those all correspond with the chakras, and, you know, if you know a bit about astrology, you know that. The, the, the planets are um, credited with having like particular kind of urges, you know, particular kind of qualities. So like Mars has this kind of like action quality. It's like willpower, you know, it's like the god of war, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the kind, the Martian energy is the kind of energy you need to adopt when you're filtering things, you're discarding things and choosing the right things, you know, like separating out. So it, it all kind of like really provides this kind of, uh, how can I say, like a, a framework of knowledge that just like ties together like all these different aspects um, and, and allows you to pull inspiration in from so many different sources that you maybe weren't pulling in before. Um, and the seven steps in life. So, uh, you know, we have our calcination is our infancy, all right? So like when we're babies, you know, we're born, we can't walk, we can't talk, you know, we have to be fed all the time, we're crying all the time. I mean, I th I've got three kids and Honestly, I think you cry more in the first four years of your life than you probably do in the whole rest of your life combined. But uh, it's a tough time, you know, it's the real, like, you know, trial. And, uh, and then you come out of your infancy and then you go into the dissolution stage, which is your school days, you know. Now, if you imagine, you know, dropping your, you know, you've got your water and you're kind of like dropping your, your um, uh, the, the product of the calcination into the water and stirring it. I mean, it's a very similar thing to what happens to us as school children, right? We just get dropped in. Uh, this big pool of other children and uh, have to spend years of our lives just uh, dissolving into that and uh, finding, you know, finding ourselves and growing up. You know. And then the separation phase is when we leave home, you know, we kind of leave our, our parents or we go out into the world and have to get a job. Uh, this is really kind of our 20s, you know, when we're like, we're separating, we're going out, we're open, you know, we're open to everything, but then we quickly realize that we don't want to be part of that and we don't want to be part of that, you know, we're like separating life out. And, you know, by the time you get to like your mid-30s and start to get to the 40s, you, you, you know, you start to figure out, you know, who you are and what it is that, you know, is important to you. And you get this kind of, this sort of material success kind of thing in the, the late 30s or whatever. You may have done something for a lot of years, you got good at it, you had some success or whatever. And then you have your midlife crisis and you realize that what you thought life was all about uh, wasn't actually what it was all about. And, uh, and that's kind of the fermentation stage. So, you know, that's like your 40s. Um, you know, there's a lot of changes, you know, you're starting to look back on life instead of always looking 
forward um, and starting to contemplate death and the afterlife and things like that, which tend to happen in that latter part of life. And then the sixth stage of distillation is like the attainment of wisdom. Um, you know, that's uh, kind of like old age, you know, really start to appreciate things on a different level. And you just have wisdom because you've lived so many years and, uh, you know, uh, you kind of know things that people who just haven't lived that long just can't know. And then, of course, the coagulation, which is the death of the body. Now, uh, you might think, how is the death of the body coagulation? It's because in alchemy, it was the coagulation of the soul. So the, the, the body is an alchemical apparatus, okay? It has all these different um, uh, organs in it, which are all energy transforming devices. They're like biological living energy transformers, and each of them has this different function to take in some kind of energy, transform it, and output another form of energy. Um, and, uh, you know, we're kind of, we have this like chemistry set within us, you know, and we can, we can put stuff in and, and learn about it, you know, because it's kind of like talks to us somehow. Um, but uh, it would seem that the body was a vessel for the tra transformation of the soul. So the death of the body is actually the coagulation of the soul, yeah? So the, when the soul is released from the, the, the body and it contains all the um, lessons and, uh, of life that, it, that has gone before it. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to finish up talking about the Philosopher's Stone, which you've probably heard of. Um, and this was uh, the kind of uh, the goal of alchemy or the goal of these kind of seven steps. You know, they talk about this Philosopher's Stone. It's this very mythical thing, which uh, even for like the first two years of studying alchemy, I didn't really know much about the stone, you know, really. But this year, there's been a lot of new information that's uh, come to me about this, like really old information. I got a bit of a better sense of it now, but I should say I'm not an alchemist. You know, I don't do any chemistry experiments in, in, in that way. Um, I've just been like uh, digesting this intellectually and looking at how it can be applied to music and art. But um, so the Philosopher's Stone, <coughs> symbolized by this, uh, this symbol here, the triangle, the circle with the triangle and the square, uh, and then another circle with the uh, is inside there, so I see something like this. This is the symbol for the Philosopher's Stone. It's quite nice because it's like a fractal as well. You can, uh, from here, obviously, create another triangle, and then another square, and then another circle, and then another triangle, and that is the circle. <coughs> of course, it could be the circle is a sine wave, the triangle is a triangle wave, and the square is a square wave, uh, which is also equivalent. <coughs> but this got me thinking, how does the Philosopher's Stone relate to music? Because on the one hand, it's said to be this kind of mythical uh, substance or material which is able to perfect anything that it touches. Okay? It's got this like harmonizing effect. They call it the elixir of life or this universal medicine. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, this medicine thing coming up and I started to think, well, it's kind of like music. I mean, when you're completely absorbed in music, you know, it has this way of uh, restoring harmony to your inner experience, you know, I mean, if you've got a broken leg, you know, playing music to the leg may not <laughs> fix the leg necessarily, but if you play music to yourself, you can restore your inner uh, world to a harmonious place, and then from that place, you're better able to go about healing your leg, you know, so music is, is a more subtle form of medicine than, uh, you know, like, you know, say, healing broken bones and things, but um, uh, it's also, you know, people say all the time, music is medicine. And this was, this was happening to me in my career. In the beginning, it was just like, it was just fun, you know? It's just like music for fun, and everyone's getting high and getting drunk, and it's just like fun, fun, fun. And fun's great and everything. But after a while, I'm like, well, am I just, am I just an entertainer? Is that it? You know, I'm just like, just entertaining for people to have fun. Is there something deeper to it? And then, and then I started seeing, well, there's this, this healing happening, you know? As I was working on my own healing, People then start coming to me and saying, oh, I had this really healing experience on the dance floor, or I had this healing experience listening to music at home. And, um, and I started to notice that as I got more into working on my own healing, that was, it was happening to other people when they were um, listening to the music. And uh, I started looking into this whole musical medicine thing. And so one day I was listening to a talk about alchemy, and, uh, and I was just kind of on my phone, and the guy was talking about the Philosopher's Stone, and I said, did he just say the Philosopher's Tone? And I was like, philosopher's tone, oh. <laughs> and so this really, oh, this just um, blew my mind. So, of course, the philosopher's stone is um, sonically, you know, identical to the philosopher's tone. 
um, and uh, which uh, you know could be a clue there, could mean the same thing. But what's the difference between a stone and a tone? Right? I mean, you think, okay, a tone is like a musical tone, and a stone is like this thing, but in the Hermetic tradition it says that all is vibration. So the question as to what is the Philosopher's Stone, well, it's a vibration. So that's all it can be, because everything is vibration. So it is a tone. Um, and, you know, we, I look up the dictionary definition of tone. Of course, I use the word tone all the time, but I never really looked at the definition of it. It's got four definitions. As a noun, it's a musical or vocal sound with reference to its pitch, quality, and strength. Or it's the general character or attitude of a person, place, or situation. So, you know, people have a kind of tone about them, or, uh, you know, a situation has a sort of tone about it. Um, and then as a verb, to tone something is to give greater strength or fitness to a body, or to harmonize with another vibration. And so, <clears throat> these are just pictures of, uh, you know, different tones through cymatics. But then I start to see this relationship with these, pretty much all these things, you know, the Philosopher's Stone is supposed to give strength and fitness to anything that it comes in contact with. Um, and uh, it also for us to harmonize, you know, harmonize things that it comes in contact with. But then we have this musical uh, or vocal sign, but this general character of attitude of a person, place, or situation. Again, this is really important. So in the recent stuff I read on the Philosopher's Stone, it said that the work of creating the stone is, there's a reason why it's called the Philosopher's Stone and not the Alchemist's Stone or the Magician's Stone or the Sorcerer's Stone. The, the Harry Potter movies, right? They, it was the Philosopher's Stone, but when they went to America, they changed it to the Sorcerer's Stone. Really interesting, you know. The, of course, it's for marketing because philosophers are boring and sorcerers are really exciting. But uh, it might have been for deeper reasons, you know, I, I'm not sure. But um, the reason it's called the Philosopher's Stone is because it was believed to be only to be able to be acquired by philosophers, by true philosophers, because there's three parts to the work, okay? There's the transformation of the materials or your art or your music. That's one part of it. Yeah, you've got to do the practical work. The other part is the soul and the spiritual part. And the Philosopher's Stone, they say, is not able to be, it's not even able to be created by anyone who does not have the soul and the spirit of a philosopher. And uh, really, the soul and the spirit of a philosopher, the tone, the, the tone of the philosophers, is really just a love for truth and knowledge and art. Um, in its purest form, you know. It's not about trying to get rich, it's not about vainglory, it's like just love of knowledge and science and exploration and discovery and love of our fellow man and this place that we live and making it better, you know. Transforming things which are not so good into things which are really uh, useful and inspiring and have utility and uh, can teach us things. And, and, and this environment that we're in now, I think, is just a, yeah, just a, an absolutely <laughs> the best example of how uh, something can be transformed into something so much more. Um, I was just going to leave on this quote from uh, Manly P. Hall. He said, The Philosopher's Stone is an ancient symbol of the perfected and regenerated man whose divine nature shines forth through the chain of purified and unfolded vehicles. Okay, it's this idea of purifying and purifying through uh, your, your work. As the rough diamond is dull and lifeless when first removed from the black carbon, so the spiritual nature of man in its fallen state, reveals little, if any, of its inherent luminosity. Just as the shapeless stone is transformed into a scintillating gem from whose facets pour streams of very colored fire, so the soul of man is ground and polished until it reflects the glory of its creator from every atom. Beautiful quote from Manly B. Hall there. So this is just telling us that the philosopher's stone is really a symbol of your ultimate self, you know, once you've done all the work, you know, you've, you've you clean yourself up. You've you've done the work. You've mastered your art. You're, you know, you're 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 just there. You know, it's it's a symbol of you know, just yeah, working and, and achieving self mastery through the practice of your art and you know, creating something which is of benefit not just to yourself but to the whole um, one mind that we're all uh, existing in. So, <clears throat> so this is my final slide, but I'm going to talk through. Uh, this uh, sigil here, this is, uh, we, we released a compilation recently with uh, uh, 17 tracks on it from uh, some of our, uh, our students of Oi Alchemy. And uh, this is the artwork that we made. So we took some of these al alchemical ideas and 
wanted to kind of like combine them into uh, something that could just like have on your desktop or whatever to inspire you. So, <clears throat> again, we got the seven steps here, okay? So the first thing we did was create the circle, okay, representing the all and uh, the universe. Uh, and then we went for the septenary, that, you know, I was talking about the septenary, that kind of holy sevenness. Uh, and we created a, a septigram. And then, using those spaces here, we have the seven steps, calibrate, flow is the dissolution, filter the separation, compose is the conjunction, edit is the fermentation, mixing is the distillation, and mastering is the coagulation. And we have here the symbols of the corresponding planetary bodies. And then on the inside, we went for a six-fold symmetry here with the hexagram. And um, we have here melody, dynamics, rhythm, and bass, which actually all correspond with the alchemical elements really nicely. So rhythm corresponds with earth, bass with water, uh, melody with uh, air, and uh, dynamics with uh, fire. And so you think like dynamics is the is how the sound moves, you know? Uh, it's like the dynamics are like the different between like, you know, James, James Brown funky drummer beat and, you know, an 808 beat that someone's just tapped out on their computer, you know? It's like no dynamics in the, in the 808, but the, the funky drummer, he's like, you know, he's like just, he's got this inner flame, which is like, you know, moving like a flame. And he's expressing that in the music and the way the mu music breathes and moves. That's the dynamics and that's our inner fire coming through <coughs> in the music. Um, melody corresponds with the element of air corresponds with thoughts. Um, melody is the sign of our thoughts. You know, if you were to filter my voice right now and take out the high frequencies, you wouldn't be able to hear what I was saying, but you'd hear the melody, like, mm -mm 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 um, you know, it's just like this melody in our voice. And uh, this is, melody is really an expression of our thoughts and our, our, our words in, in a musical way. Um, and then rhythm and bass, you know, bass corresponds with emotion. Um, one good way of, of showing this is that, uh, again, if you cut out, if you take, or if like, say like the people upstairs from you are fighting, right? You can't hear what they're saying, but you hear the emotion because you can hear the bass in their voices, okay? So like if you take a human voice, filter out all the high frequencies, just keep the bass, you will know if they're angry or if they're gentle or sad. But if you do it the other way, you, would, you wouldn't know. If you filtered out all the low end and just had the, the words in the top end, you wouldn't hear the emotion. So uh, motion is very much tied to bass. Um, and uh, rhythm uh, to the earth, of course, the rhythms of the earth. The rhythm is like the lowest frequency of the music, you know, the beat. And uh, earth is the, the lowest, uh, the, the most dense of the, of the four elements. Um, and then we added in uh, medicine and inspiration here. So inspiration is like, you've heard of the fifth element, okay? The fifth element is ether. You know, it's where everything kind of comes from. It's kind of coming out of the ether. Um, and that's the kind of inspiration part. And we added medicine in here, of course, because that is uh, a crucial part of all of this. Um, the thing with a lot of this knowledge is that you, you can't understand it until you've done the healing work on yourself. Okay, a, you know, this, this comes up again and again. It's like when you do healing work on yourself, it, knowledge will be revealed to you. Things will start to make more sense than they did before. Uh, medicine, you know, all these medicines that we take, and the, the transformations that happen to us is really important in the development of this, uh, this whole thing. So we have medicine in there. And then in the center we have three parts, method and wisdom, which is really a reference to like the kind of two halves of the brain. We have this kind of methodical, rational half, and then this other half which is more experiential, more intuitive, uh, the wisdom. And then humility, you know, just being humble, I think, is a really important um, thing for musicians because they, they you know, we, we're put on stages, you know, we're, we're, we're amplified and um, often that can amplify the ego um, and uh, people can get a little bit lost in like ego traps and stuff like that. It happens all the time. So we put humility in there, just stay humble, you know, remember your roots, remember what you are. Um, so yeah, and then in the middle there we have the sine wave with uh, harmonics because the sine wave really is the thread that connects everything together because everything is vibration and all vibration is composed of sine waves. So, um, yeah, that's my presentation. Uh, is there any questions? Thank you. When are you playing? Oh yes, uh, the music. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, yes, I'm playing on Friday afternoon, four till six on the chill out stage. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Again? Chill out stage, Friday, four till six in the afternoon. Four till six. Uh, yeah, well, we have to get more printed, but yeah, we had these printed uh, during our last retreat. I know I didn't talk much about the retreat, but uh, if anyone would like me to talk, I mean, we had a pretty extraordinary one, but I'll, I'll take some questions first, yeah. Uh, hold on, I think someone will bring you the, the mic there. First, uh, thank you for sharing your beautiful process and uh, knowledge. I'm curious to understand how you apply the knowledge of the healing aspect within your workflow. I'm sure there are many producers here. So how do you make it a healing and therapeutic aspect for yourself in the studio? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, the, the relationship to healing, I guess, in the beginning it was like, well, when you finish a track, I mean, when you, the difference between who you are when you start the track and who you are when you finish a track, you know, there's a clear difference. You feel like you've done something, you know, you've given birth to a thing, you know, you're, a part of you is now out in the world, uh, kind of seeping into people's minds and kind of changing, uh, you know, your uh, subjective reality. Um, so there's this kind of transformation that happens and um, so with the healing thing, it was kind of like a, it's kind of like the attitude that you bring to the process that you're doing and the work that you're doing when you're not making music as well, you know, it's like, um, you know, I mean, I, I had a, a phase of life where I was like m much more like hedonistic and, uh, you know, but I, I started to feel that that was just like, you know, it was just going to take me further and further away from where I wanted to be. Uh, and a big sort of switch came uh, around about 2012. I started looking into like etymology and the, the word drug. <laughs> and uh, I'm realizing that the word drug, it really just means dried, right? Dried, as uh, I think it's from uh, old uh, Dutch. Um, and it was just used, you know, it was a word used for like dried things, you know, like powders and, you know, spices and stuff like that. And we now use that word a a as a word for medicine. Because right? you start to think, well, what's the difference between a drug and a medicine, you know? Uh, this is there isn't, you know, there isn't, like, it's all medicine. I mean, the difference between medicine and poison is dosage. Yeah, so, like, everything can be medicine at some dosage, you know, or poison at another dosage. But it's all medicine. There's no such thing as a, as a, as a drug. It's just, a drug is just a word for, like, a class of dried, powdery things, but it's kind of now misused. And I made that connection. I wrote an article about it for Reality Sandwich, and, and I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to stop taking drugs start taking medicine <laughs> and uh, it just completely changed the effect that the substances were having on me and the insights that were coming to me just all changed with that simple shift of just being like you know I'm no longer taking drugs I'm taking medicine you know there's so many things that spin spin off of that you know I mean it, if you start to replace the word medicine for the word drug you have things like instead of the drug war you have the medicine war yeah, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's a war to stop people from getting access to the medicine that they, they want or they need. Um, you know, we have uh, things like, it's a drug addict, you know, you have like a medicine addict, which, you know, drug addicts got this kind of, uh, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, bad media sort of uh, drug addicts. Uh, <laughs> but a medicine addict kind of makes you more compassionate. You're like, well, if someone's addicted to medicine, they, you know, they're, they need healing, you know, they're taking medicine. Um, it changes, you know, it just changed everything. So. That for me was the biggest change, and then that's when, after that point, you know, then people who were coming to me talking about their experiences with the music, the language changed, you know, people, it wasn't like, oh man, I'm so fucked up, and I was seeing, you know, fractals and all that kind of shit, it was like, no, I had a healing experience on the task floor, you know, and uh, uh, so it really just changed the, the whole thing, so uh, does that answer your question in some way? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Oh, what do you think about the bands and vocalists and whatever people that make music um, and they express the negative and sad emotions through their music mm -hmm. and uh, what do you think about that how, how they affect the world mm. 
Yeah, well, uh, no, absolutely. I mean, like, yeah, sad and, you know, uh, dark or angry music and stuff, you know, can still be absolutely uh, uh, healing and medicinal for people, but through the, through the mechanism, uh, mechanism of resonance. Yeah, so if you have, you know, if you can relate, yeah, it's, uh, you, you can relate to what the musician is communicating, whether it's, you know, love and light or, you know, life sucks or whatever, you know, whatever it is, if you can relate to it, it has a healing effect through the process of resonance, you know, but if you can't relate to it at all, there's like a, a dissonance and, you know, if you're just, you know, you're all love and light now, you've dealt with your, your darkness or whatever, but, uh, and so maybe the, the dark music is just not resonating with you anymore, but for an earlier time in life, you're still working through a lot of things and that dark music was just really giving you the validation, the energy that you needed, so, you know, it all has its place, I don't, I don't think it's about dark music and happy music, it's about music which is made out of love uh, and, and personal growth, or music which is made to actually uh, manipulate and control people, which is, it's like white magic and dark magic, R rather, yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Hey, Steve. Over here. Yo, hey. Joe. Hey, could you talk about some of the like the the, thought, the concepts you had in our course about like alternative tunings and just intonation and other stuff like that on the subject of resonance? Because you, you made a lot of you, you said a lot of important things when I heard you then. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I mean on the whole uh, 432 tuning and stuff, which I go deep into a lot of that stuff. I've done a lot of research on that as well. Um, you know, I think maybe what you're referring to is. Uh, you know, getting like a truly harmonic tuning system with uh, numbers and so on. It's kind of difficult to go into without showing you all the tables of numbers and all the calculations and things. But um, we have this modern system of equal temperament and 440 hertz, and then this uh, system of 432 tuning, which, you know, there's been lots of like, you know, musicians slinging shit at each other about it and everything for years now. Um, but it's, you know, there really, is, there really is something to it, you know. The, the thing with the equal temperament tuning system is that all the note values other than A, uh, A440, all the other note values are calculated by multiplying by this number called the twelfth root of two. Okay, it's called the twelfth root of two. Um, and that's an irrational number. It's a completely irrational number with no, re no repeating patterns or, you know, like pi. It's just like a, a, a the last I read it had been calculated to 20 billion decimal places. Um, so it's, a, it's a fundamentally irrational number, yeah? I mean, there's no ratios in it, okay? And harmonics all about ratios and precise ratios. And so the, the equal temperance system, although it sounds quite pleasant and it's very close to being harmonic, it, is, it can actually never be truly harmonic. You can never have the waves like, adding up perfectly like you would see in a, an architectural structure, for example. You know, if, if you're building something, you know, everything has to be exact, you know? The word harmony means joining, okay? Harmony is about things that join together precisely. Um, and so our modern tuning system is not um, built that way. It's very close, you know, it's very close and, you know, it's still beautiful. I'm, I, all the music I ever loved is in 440 and equal temperament, so I'm not dissing it. But mathematically, um, it's not possible to create a truly uh, harmonic uh, musical structure within an equal temperament uh, setting. Does that kind of answer your question a bit? Or did I go off? <laughs> um, yeah. This audio alchemy that you that you did with the medicinal music that is played not only on the ceremonies but uh, well everywhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, let music be thy medicine. Of course, you've heard the phrase like "let food be thy medicine." <laughs> I let medicine be thy food. It was kind of inspired by that. But it's twofold, you know. It's like if you're a musician, then let your creative process be your medicine. Okay. So, like, you know. If you're a listener, then let the music you're listening to be your medicine. You know, there's kind of two sides to it, um, and you know, it can be. It, it can go both ways. You know, that's the thing. We can, it, you know, for some people, they can start making music. They get really famous. They, you know, get all kinds of problems and drug addiction and all this kind of thing, and then they crash and burn really early, um, and it can just end up being quite a, uh, you know, destructive, um, non-healing experience for them. Um, and so, you know, anyone who's been in the game long enough, you've seen it happen to people again and again and again, like talented young people who just come up and then they're just like, they're suddenly put on a pedestal and given all these excesses and all these enablers coming along going, yeah, man, whatever you want, whatever you want. And then it just, they just can't handle it. And uh, it happens all the time. Um, so we really want to put this message just like, no, it's supposed to be about medicine, right? You come here to feel good 
And when you leave, you want to feel better, right? Than when you started. Okay, that's a medicinal transformation. Um, and uh, you know, so the days of just getting like super trashed and just kind of digging deeper <laughs> hole for yourself every weekend, you know, that for me that's over. You know, I want every show and every track and stuff to like you know reveal new you know knowledge to me and um, you know to take me further. I feel feel like I'm growing and uh, that I'm helping you know the world with what I do rather than just satisfying my own like twisted sense of humor or whatever. You know, it's uh, it's doing it. You're know, doing it like a, in a radiative way rather than like sucking all the energy from it in for yourself, you know? Um, I think that's, does that help? Does that answer the question? <laughs> uh, any other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, so if I was just wanting to kind of um, hope that you could. Um, elaborate on uh, the sister's question mm -hmm. about emotional energy trans uh, transference through music. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I understand it, you know, because we all come from God and this is our separated state and uh, the process is an unfoldment back to that which we already are. Um, so the process of healing would be clearing and transmuting the energy that isn't necessary mm -hmm. and clearing it from, from the body and from our energy bodies. Yeah then how does just the resonance corresponding or, or, or you know, matching a resonance that's within you mm -hmm. of perhaps a, an unnecessary emotion mm -hmm. that you're holding, how, yeah. how is that healing? If uh -huh. it's not, does that, I don't see yeah, that, that I see your clear question. it. Yeah, yeah, well, the way like resonance can work, like, um, you know, you've seen these, uh, uh, you've heard this thing that when soldiers are marching across the bridge, you know, they have to they have to all stop marching and then start walking differently to cross the bridge, because if they all march in step, the bridge will basically collapse. That's the resonance effect. So um, there's a great TED talk actually about um, killing cancer cells with sound. Have you seen that? And this works by, you know, and he's not using music, he's just using sound waves of a particular frequency with a particular harmonic, uh, the 11th harmonic, I believe. And so he'll basically, if you have this cancer cell, right, and it's like, say, this big, <coughs> you get a sine wave, which back to wherever it came from. <laughs> that's the other way I see. I mean, that's how it feels within me, you know. I, when I have a, that kind of experience where, you know, something just, just gets, yeah, just resolved or yeah, resolved or dissolved um, through the music, yeah, it feels like this just shift, you know, just in the energy body, just this kind of, you know, something that was kind of like packed in is something I just kind of like loosened and... Oh, yeah. I hope that explains that. I know it's it's kind of hard to understand like, what's happening internally because it's all based on feeling, you know. Yeah, sure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, thank you. Anybody else? Does that mean I can start partying now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much.